Praise the Lord. We're going to leave some time for questions, but before that time, I want you to look at Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two. We're looking at verse twenty three. Are you there? But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strive, and the servants of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men and apt to teach and patient. When we come to a session like this, after studying the scriptures, searching the scriptures together, and I will say we're going to have questions and answers. It's such an important time to help our lives, to lift up the falling, to encourage those who are discouraged, to save lives and save families, and to be able to give us the knowledge of what we need to know as individuals, as families, as a church. It's also a training ground for our leaders, our workers, and upcoming prospective leaders in the future. And so we need to understand the sacredness of such a time and not just be coming up with questions that are foolish, questions that derail the church, and questions that show that questioner does not have love for God, respect for God, respect for the house of God, and questions that bother on blasphemy. And so we need to set ourselves right. And there's no problem if you don't have any question. It's better to be quiet, not to have a question, than to ask questions that derail. So we're going to rise up now. We're going to see going to have questions because it's a very important subject. And you're going to pray. And after the prayer, we'll give you to a chance to ask a question. Will you rise up to pray? Commit yourself to the Lord. And you tell the Lord that today you set your heart right. Give yourself to the Lord. And pray that the Lord will give you the heart to show respect for the house of the Lord. And the questions you ask will minister to the needs of those that have peculiar problems. And that your attitude in the house of God will be an attitude of respect, of worship. You'll know the sacred nature of every moment, every time, we spend in the house of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you, Lord, because the church is the bride of Christ. And we pray, Lord, as we come together at this time, looking at the world, that you lead us, Lord, into the depths of your truth in Jesus' name. And your truth will set us free. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Thank you. You can sit down now. From the youth section, I really shouldn't give you a chance to ask a question today. This is adult stuff. But all the same, your section, you have any question, you are free to stand up and come to the front of your hall. From the adult section, you have any question, you are free to come to the front of your hall. So we'll see how many questions we can take. Can I have the little lady there? Good morning, sir. Good morning. Sir, for instance, those that were not born again, when they were still in the world, maybe in that case they got married and give birth to children. But after a long period of time, someone preached to them and they were converted. In that case, when they now join the people of God, serving God, does it mean that such marriage is still holy? That is, yes, the holy. You know, Abraham and Sarah got married before they knew the Lord. They were already husband and wife, and God called them. And when God called them, they didn't dissolve the marriage. The marriage was still holding. Even Peter, the apostle Peter, had gotten married 
before he knew the Lord. And after, the, after knowing the Lord, the marriage was still holding. And we can give you many examples in the Bible that whatever you did before you were born again, one man, one wife, not a second wife, not a second husband, but the first man or the first woman, they got married together. When they know the Lord, they remain in the state in which they were. Now they bring up their children in the way of the Lord. You understand? God bless you. Can I have a brother there? From what our teacher told us today, I'm confused as I read verse 8. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. I'm confused because uh, there was a commandment from the beginning that a wife should not be put away. But Moses came and said, because these people have hardness of heart, you can put away your wife. Confused because I feel Moses is compromising. Because there is a later instruction that nobody should put away his wife. So does it now mean that if we are leading people and they don't want to dance to God's tune, and they don't want to do what God wants them to do, we shall allow them to have their way. That's my confession, sir. Thank you very much. I'll come back to you. Can I have the sister there? Good morning, sir. My question, although I'm not reading any passage of the scripture. Although you are not what? Uh, it's not applicable to any verse of uh, scripture. Go ahead. So it's a practical question, right? What I wanted to um, ask, I won't really say the question, but I wanted to read it because it has been bothering my mind, especially the time I knew that it was um, the marriage and the family uh, is the topic we are going to study today. What actually happened is that in the marriage, um, the marriage in this church, I've noticed something, especially when we are in courtship, in the aspect of knowing the man and in the aspect of the, the, the house the man is living. I wanted to know, why is it that sisters are not allowed to go to the brother's house? In the sense that he's not going directly there, but with a leader, either two leaders or one of the women rep, so that the leader can, I mean, the sister can know the, the situation in the house of the man. It's not that we'll just be talking together just like that without knowing the facts about the brother. We can always sit down together. We can always talk. But if we don't know where about the brother, and the brother just told the married committee that this is um, this where I'm living, this is my lifestyle, and by the time you get to the house, you discover that the reverse is the case. And most of our sisters are harboring this thing in their mind. Some people, they are not enjoying their marriage in the sense that what, what, what they see when they get to the man's house is another thing. But I feel that at least they should give the sister the chance. It's not that I understand that they are trying to protect we sisters so that sin will not come in during our um, courtship. But at the same time, there should be some, I don't know, some kind of allowance so that these sisters know it's, it's the thing that is bothering me. And I have to say, although I'm married, but for the people coming behind me, they have not to made the same mistake. We are praying that we should get to heaven. But... It's not that we should be praying and be binding the devil when, we are, when we've gotten married. We always pray to get to heaven and to make uh, other progress. Sir, my second question. Sir, my second question is on the aspect of our brothers. Although this is, uh, everybody has is our um, weak points, but our brothers, I don't know. I, w I wouldn't say maybe some of them, they don't make their kind of characters known to us even before the marriage. But when, when you get into the marriage, you begin to discover a lot of things. But I feel that maybe uh, this singles, um, uh, the singles program for men separate, for women separate, so that the, the uh, brothers, they can know how to treat their wife. They can know how to go about marriage. These other churches, they have room for all those things. They teach them what they have to do. Even I have friends that when they, they share with me what they teach them, I'm always, I feel bad that, ah, God, as me, I, we have the, this opportunity. I think we'll have worked better than this. That's Thank you point. very much. I think uh, I'll go to Hall one. Are you there to ask question or you just want to let me have the brother there? Good morning, sir. I want to read from Ruth chapter 3 verse 10, sir. Ruth chapter 3 verse 10. And he said, 
Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. Sir, so I look at marriage in the Old Testament and I see that um, a lot of them uh, made mistakes, married, so married to, like in the case of Jacob, he got four wives. So, what's your question? My what question, is? sir, in the New Covenant, the New Testament, in the church today, how, like Ruth, uh, Boaz uh, said of Ruth, he called her my daughter. How do we handle age uh, matters disparity in the New Testament? Are church? you married? No, sir. So you're asking for yourself? Praise the Lord. Let's come back to Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, we're looking at verse 8. He said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. A brother wants to know, did Moses compromise? Well, whatever we say about Moses, thank God, Moses is in heaven. We know that because uh, when the Lord went to the Mount of Transfiguration and was transfigured before his disciples, we know that Moses was there, Elijah was there. I know Elijah was carried into heaven without seeing death. So we know that he is in heaven. So whatever you say and whatever coming to a pass does not affect Moses. But the question is, can you do that today? Can you say because of the hardness of the hearts of the people that then you bend the word of God or the rule of God? No, you cannot. Because the reason why Jesus said what he said is this. In the old covenant, you had hardness of heart, stiffness of neck, incorrigibility. That is, you went your way. And the Lord gave you the permissive will and said, that's all right. It's not a perfect covenant after all. And therefore you can do this and you can do this. But now the Lord Jesus came to remove that hardness of heart. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 36. Where the Lord looking into the future. Give them the covenant and show them what he was going to do. In Ezekiel chapter 36, I'm reading from verse 25. Then will I speak of clean water upon you. And you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away, what's that? The stony heart. I'm going to take away that hardness of heart. That's why Jesus Christ, in preaching to the people, in telling the people, he said, in the olden days, this is what you heard. But now, this I say unto you. And he put everything straight. Now, when the new covenant, the hardness of heart is removed. And we're now totally submissive to the Lord. And if we're going to serve the Lord, if we're going to follow the Lord, if we're going to get to heaven, here is what the Lord demands. That the word is clear. And we're going to be obedient to the words of the Lord. He gets us saved. He gets us sanctified. And then he gets us baptized in the Holy Ghost. And he gets us united with himself. They in me. I in them. That they may be one in us. And so we don't have that hardness of heart. Now for the Lord to say, okay, because of the hardness of your heart, this is what I'm going to do. The word of God stands today. And as the word of God stands, in fact, we're not told in Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth thee the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. After the final book of the New Testament had been written. Now we're told, if you add anything to the words, 
then plagues shall be added unto you. Judgment shall be added. Curses shall be added. And damnation shall be added. Verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his parts out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now, if we take anything away from the word of God, because that word of God is either pinching us or pricking us or punching us, it's inconvenient for us and it's kind of condemning our lifestyle. Because of that, a preacher might say, I don't think I want to preach that. I don't think I want to go that direction. Because if I do, it's going to show my life as shallow, as superficial, as unscriptural. If you take away from the word of God, the Lord will take away your part out of the book of life. And then when you've missed heaven, what do you gain? So the word of God still stands. And thank God this is deep alive, Bible church. We're going to keep to the word of God forever in Jesus' name. I come to the question of my brother here before I come back to a sister there. That in the Old Testament, uh, people made mistakes. Well, in the New Testament, people made mistakes too. And it was not only in marriage, they made mistakes. They made mistakes in other decisions too. Both Old Testament and New Testament. And the Lord showed us those mistakes so that we can avoid their mistakes. It's not showing us those mistakes so that we'll be able to follow those mistakes and ruin our lives and destroy ourselves. Romans chapter 15, we're looking at verse 4. Romans chapter 15, looking at verse 4. Here yeah, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, they were written for our learning, that we through the comforts and the patience of scriptures might have hope. It's saying, yes, they made mistakes, many of them, and Old Testament, New Testament. What are you going to do about those mistakes? You don't follow after those mistakes. You avoid the mistakes so you don't ruin yourself. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now all these things happened unto them. For examples, and they are reaching for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. It says, all those things happened to them. Talk about Jacob and talk about other people in the Old Testament and in the New Testament too. Those things happened unto them for our admonition. They happened unto them for learning. They are put unto them for our example. And it says, we now, the ends of the world are come. And we need to take note and we need to be very careful so we don't allow those things to happen unto us. In verse 12, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Him that thinketh he standeth, let him take heed lest what? Let's say fall. And so, as you think about marriage, as you think about courtship, as you think about the wedding, as you think about the family living together, let him that thinketh, he standeth, take it, lest he fall. Because, you know, after you have fallen, well, if you are able to rise up, praise the Lord. But we need to warn you, there are people that fell and they were not able to stand up again. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 14. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. You know, sometimes uh, because of marriage, you can destroy your future, and you can take a decision that eventually leads you astray. And say, what's important to me now is get married. Have a man, have a woman. Change my status. Change my identity. I don't want to be a bachelor. I don't want to remain a spinster. I must get married now, now. And once you do it, you've done it. And here it says, look diligently. 
lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root, any root of bitterness, of corruption, of evil, of sin, rising up, springing up, trouble you. And thereby, you are not the only one that even gets defiled. Many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane, useless, superficial person like Esau, or for one morsel of meat. And after that meal, he lost the birthright. After that act, he lost the birthright. After that event, he lost the birthright. And never, never could regain it again, even though he sought with many tears. That's why you want to be careful that this one chance you have, you don't ruin your life. It says in verse 17, For ye know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it. How? With what? Yet he couldn't get it back. That's why you want to consider your life. You want to think about yourself. The decision you are taking today, in five years' time, in ten years' time, would you still take the same decision if you had the same chance? Think about the future. Think about eternity. And I come to this important question now about courtship and about talking together, interaction during the time of getting prepared to be married. Our sister is married already, so she's not asking for herself. She's asking for the progress of the church. And it's asking for the stability and the solidity of her faith. Let's come to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23, verse 2. Saying, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Those are leaders, religious leaders. Leaders in the synagogue. Leaders in the temple. And for us today, leaders in the church. They see it in Moses' seat. They call the shots. They take the decisions. And they take decisions affecting the lives of other people. Verse 4. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born. And lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. That talks about the style of leadership of the Pharisees. The style of leadership of the Sadducees. And the style of leadership of some church leaders today. And it says they bind heavy bodies grievous to be born. And as we look at our church, and I'm one of the leaders, past number one leader. And then I have other leaders that are subordinate to me, that are working along with me. And maybe some of the things they do, they got from me. And some of these things they laid down, they said, this is the way to go. And that is the way to go. Maybe they thought they're following the principles that the GS laid down. But whether we're doing that or not, we need to find out what's the consequence of some of the things we do. And what's the result of the decisions we have taken? And what is the outcome of the principles and the paths and the practices we follow? You're going to find as you read the whole Bible, not only the New Testament, you're going to find that a lot of things are missing on marriage. For example, Abraham and Sarah got together. We don't know they got married. We cannot tell what processes they went through. And then we know about Isaac and Rebekah. We know how he got married, that this man went and then he prayed by the well. And then when he prayed by the well, the lady showed up. And we know that, you know, the man, Elisa, the chief servant, whatever his name was, he went to the family and said, now, here is it. And they said, this is from the Lord. And then we know, we happen to know, that he said, can I go now? They said, let the woman say with us, how many days? How many days? Ten days. Ten days is less than two weeks. And he even said, I'm not going to, since the Lord has permitted me, granted me, 
this opportunity. Why are you going to delay me? Okay, let's ask the lady. And he said, will you go with this man? What did he say? I'll go. And then they released her. And here was uh, Isaac, and he was walking in the field. As he was walking in the fields, what happened? The woman saw, who is that man? Oh, they said, that's my master's son. That's the one I'm taking you to. Then she lighted down on the, on the moon and then covered herself. And they were told, and Isaac did what? Took her, and then they started living together. You're going to find there was no wedding. The one we call wedding ceremony today, it wasn't there. We're not saying there will be no wedding ceremony. I'm just telling you that many of the things we say, and we say go this way and go this way, we do that because we believe that will help you. And that will help us. It's not that we can say chapter such and such, but such and such. And that's why I'll be making it clear to you that this is how it is. And this is the scripture. And then eventually you know that that man, he had, you know, it was a good marriage, although there was no child for about 20 years, but he prayed and God answered his prayer, and God gave them children. And, you know, I think it's my brother here that mentioned rules. Let, let's talk about rules. Here we come. He, Ruth was a widow, and then she came to the land of Israel. And uh, now he says, you know, time plan your future for you. Go and glean in the fields. And then she lighted on the field of boars. And when she got there, she gleaned with them and, you know, did all that ought to be done. And then eventually, notice this, notice this, that Naomi said, I'm going to plan for you. And then she went and she lay by the feet of Boaz. And Boaz just got started. Who is that? And he said, it's your maid. What she read, that's when Boaz said what he said. And he said, okay, you can go. Don't allow anybody to know that you are here with me in my band. And then went back and Naomi said, where have you gone? And Drew said, this is where I've been. And you know what Naomi said? He said, all right, you can stay relaxed and rest. I know that man will not rest until he accomplishes everything today, this day. And eventually, Boaz contacted the other case man that was near. Oh, that one said, I'm not interested. I don't want to spoil my inheritance. And then he called the elders together. I'm telling you that within one day, one week at the most, They've done everything. And all the six months and the nine months and the one year was not there. I'm not saying there should not be six months of courtship or one year of courtship. I'm just telling you that we didn't pick that from the Bible. We just felt you need some time to know one another. And then we said one month will be too short nowadays and two months will be too short. And why not six months? It's not a lot from the Bible. It's our own principle here. And it's good principle. But I'm telling you that as a Christian, we need to become so matured that you know the difference between the law of God and the principles in the church. And if you come to me and you say, I want you to spend less than six months, I'm going to ask you why. I'm going to say you need to know the man. You need to know the woman. You need to interact together. You need to, you know, rub your minds together. You need a period of knowledge together. And so, the six months is all right, but it's not something inflexible. And if we change anything and we say, okay, allow them three months, we're not going to say, why are they changing the Bible? Six months is not in the Bible. And we say, now you need one year. You're not ready yet because you don't have this, you don't have that. Why are they changing the Bible when it came to my turn? Everybody is spending six months in worship. Why is my own one year? We're not changing the Bible. Six months is not in the Bible. And then all the, if you come to the New Testament, you're not going to find, as you read from Acts of the Apostles, there's no wedding ceremony in Acts of the Apostles. And as you come to Romans or First Corinthians or Second Corinthians, until Revelation, there is no, you know, I know the will of God. As a marriage there is no marriage committee in the New Testament. That's our own making because we have a large church and we don't want you to make mistakes. And so we say, how do we help you? So we put the marriage committee there. We put the marriage committee there. It's to help you, not because we can give you a chapter and a verse. It's church administration. 
and his church organization. And if you make use of it, it's to your advantage. And that's why I'm telling the you know, marriage committees, don't exercise an authority that God has not given you. This is just church at me. And if you understand that, we're not going to be like the Pharisees setting heavy bodies upon the people. Now, come to my sister's question. Are you following what I'm saying? Church, are you all right? Because you know sometimes we can defend church law more than God's law. And there are churches that do that. That they abandon the law of God and the only thing they knock their heads on the wall about is their own, the church law. The one they said. And we are saying here, we say, the law of God is what takes us to heaven. You're born again, you obey the word of God, the word of God, that's what takes you to heaven. And we're saying, if there's anything we said, and you don't understand, and you say, Pastor, show me the verse and show me the chapter. And I say, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter, there's no chapter here. There's no verse here. This is just what you rest up. And it's to help you. And if you disagree with me on anything I said, which there's no chapter, there's no verse, you're all right. We also have a different idea, different opinion. But you'll bear the consequence if you disagree with me. Because I happen to be wiser than you are. And if you disagree with the wise man, with the wise leader, you're going to face the consequence. But you'll get to heaven. You might, you, know, you might break your leg. You might you know, break your neck. You might have you know, traumatic marriage. You might have whatever it is you have. And I'll be there to be praying for you. And I thank God God will answer my prayer for you. And uh, you know, you can, you'll see, get to heaven. You'll see, get to heaven, provided you're keeping to the law of God. And that's all I'm saying. And so, I don't want uh, the church to say, oh, they've spoiled everything. No, we always spoil. It's your own law, it's your own idea. Now, why do we have caught sheep? Our sister already said that as we eventually get married, and we know these men, and we know these women, we're surprised at what we see. And our sister is asking, why don't they allow us? We don't want to commit sin. We know that fornication is sinful. We know that immorality is sinful. We're not going to do that. Let somebody go with us. We're not going to go alone. Let's visit the man. Let's see how he lives. Let's see how needs is surrounding his. Let's see. How his people are. You're not just marrying the man. You're marrying the man, but he has a lot of these people with him. His own mother, his own father, his own relatives and all the people. And when you get, when you get to their houses, you'll be able to see how they relate to you, respond to you, react to you. You'll see what's their own concept about interpersonal relationship, about attitudinal manifestation. You'll see how his environment is. And our sister is saying, why is it that, you know, they get us somewhere when we're in courtship, and this is no man's land. Doesn't belong to the man, doesn't belong to the woman. And in this no man's land, and the man, if he's a good, well-controlled man, can be stingy with information, while the woman is generous with information. And then the man might just smile and say, you know, everything is all right. And you ask any question, everything is okay. You can never get anything positive or negative. Everything is okay. Everything is neutral. And this man is playing a game. Why don't we follow him to the house? Where does he live? Is he neat? Is he compatible? How does he reason? How lazy is it? Hard working is he? Which kind of people surround him? Show me your friends, and I'll show you who you are. Show me the kind of people you live with, and I'll show you. Show me your environment, and I'll show you the kind of person you are. That's what our sister is saying. And I'm asking myself, why not, if not, follow them home? I'm assuming that, you know, any sister that wants to get married, I'm assuming that you are reasonable. You're not going to go at 12 o'clock in the night. You're not going to go at 11 o'clock in the night. You're going to go at a time you can see what you want to see. And I'm assuming that the men too, I'm assuming that you are reasonable and you're not going to go alone. I'm not going to ask foolish questions. You're not going to get into things that will get you into trouble. All you're looking for is, I'm taking this decision. 
and I can only marry once, except the woman or the man dies. And since this is just the decision I'm going to take, and my life is going to suffer for it, marriage committee is not going to bear my body with me. Pastor G.S. is not going to bear my body with me. And because this is my life, this thing may eventually land you in hell. You know, if you have such a traumatic marriage, you know, before you're married, you are coming to church, no concern, no care. You carry your Bible, you are happy, you are, you know, I'm deep alive. Now you get married, and there's fire at home. And then they invite you to come for deliverance here and come for prayer there. You never went to another place where you were single. What were you looking for? I just love my church deep alive. It's after the marriage. And after maybe there's no child or the man is not working and there's no money and you're bearing whole body and the man never says he thank you and you're almost asleep there and then you get dissatisfied with him, you get disenchanted with the church. It's after that you start looking about and that may take heaven away from you. And if something will take heaven away from you, what are you going to look at? You know, pastor will not like that. Forget about me. What will I not like? Whatever you know will be for your future. Whatever you know will lead you to heaven. Whatever you know, this is my life and this is heaven for me. Go ahead. We've taught you the principles. You can live by those principles. And when you've done that, and you know, if you need our help, we'll counsel you. If you must allow somebody to, you know, to be with you so you don't get into sin or into trouble. And our marriage committees, and actually our state overseers, our region overseers are here. Are you here, my brothers? Or you can you stand up? Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. I, you know, had a meeting that finished yesterday, and I knew what we would be into today, so I sent a message to them. I said, please, don't go. Stay. Because I wanted you to hear my bombshell. So, <laughs> praise the Lord. I knew that questions will come because I knew what we were studying today. I said, now that you are here, if you have been overhearing that, you know, the pastor has been saying this and saying this and you're wondering, did he say that? I wanted you to hear from the horse's mouth. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. Our overseers, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Uh, the reason I'm telling the church this, your leaders, I'll tell you this. We do a lot of evangelism in this country. I don't think there's any other church that does as much evangelism and we spend life, we spend the resources, we spend everything. And then we win a lot of souls into the kingdom and they come into this church. And when it gets to marriage, you and I know that things have been so tough for our young people getting married that we lose Hundreds or thousands of people from the church. And as I've been moving about, I go to this church. Somebody runs to me and greets me and I say, How do you know me? He said, You are my pastor. I said, Which church do you go? He mentions the church. I said, How am I your pastor if you know you're in another church? And the fellow will say, Pastor, I love the teaching. I accept everything you say. But when I wanted to get married, Pastor, I couldn't see you. It was tough. That's why I ran away. And now I'm married and, you know, uh, and I'm okay where I am. And any time you come for programming or see anywhere, I'll be there because you're still my pastor. Then I sat back and I said, how can we keep on doing this? That we're walking and we're losing the people. Because, not because of the law of God, not because of the doctrines of the Bible, but because of the laws that were set. And I said, if we really want people to get to heaven, and we know that God has raised deeper life up, to be able to teach the way of truth, why don't we just relax any of these other things and, and not feel threatened in leadership and not feel that, okay, if they don't obey me, how can I be a real leader? I'd rather people don't obey me and they walk on me into the kingdom of God than stand in the way they have said, if you don't recognize me, you're not going to get to heaven. I don't want anybody to miss heaven because of me or because I'm trying to be a leader, a strong leader. I just teach the Bible and the rest I can forget. Is that all right, leader? I said, is that all right? Give me a good yes. You don't have a microphone. Thank you. You can sit down. And so, church, that's the reason we're doing what we're doing. When you got saved, that was your personal decision. You got sanctified, that was your personal decision. And you became workers in the church, that's your personal decision. Yeah, you're remaining in deeper life, that's your personal decision. And if those great decisions were yours, personal, 
the rest of your life, all the other decisions still should be your personal decision. I say it should be your personal decision. I want to apologize on behalf of uh, the church and leadership. Those of you who have gotten married and those of you who are still to get married, you know, sometimes we are majored in the minor. It might be a little thing, a little button in your dress, and a little kind of lining in your scarf or whatever. I said, no, if you cannot shape up on this, I'm going to give you scripture for that. I just said, no, here we are. We're keeping the standard. Honestly, contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, contending for a button, contending for a lining in the scarf, contending for how long, you know, your wedding gown is, contending for, some even people say it must not be white, it must be red, is it? Black? Okay, you know, you know the color now. Praise the Lord. I'm just saying that contending for the faith is not contending for the color of your dress. It's not contending for all these minor, minor, inconsequential things. It's contending for the truth, for the basic scripture. And that's why we're here. That's what we're standing on now. And the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. And uh, those of us who have gotten married and you're having some challenges, I'm here for you. And by the grace of God, we'll turn everything around. And those of you who are still to get married... Now you can relax and rejoice because now I say, just look at the scriptures and follow the scriptures. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. I'll be firm where the scripture is clear. I'll be neutral while the scripture has nothing to say. Is that all right? Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, here am I. And give yourself to the Lord. Give yourself to the Lord. Let's have the heart that honors God. The heart that follows the Lord. Let's make a difference between the law of God and the law of men. Offer your heart to the Lord. That will take away the hardness of heart. The rigidity of mind. That blocks out the grace of God. Sanctification takes away the stony heart. Holiness comes a deeper inward grace. Makes your life gracious, loving, realistic, knocks off tradition of man. Makes you to honor God. Makes you to think of heaven. Are you getting there? More than any other thing. Holiness sanctification. Makes you yielded, flexible in the hand of God. Takes stubbornness away from the heart. You don't want to manipulate God. Be greater than God. You don't want your ideas, your opinion, your style to be higher than the word of God. Be a real child of God. Ask the Lord for more grace to live to please the Lord rather than to please yourself. 